Good evening. And it's a pleasure to be back with you again after 12 years. I, uh, I have to admit that this is, again, is quite an honor to speak to the Chicago Civil War Roundtable. We, as I told the Milwaukee folks last night, in my profession, you've mentioned many of my good friends and colleagues, Terry Winchell, Dennis Fry tonight, uh, Dr. Hughes, I knew very well. I appreciate you letting me know about his passing. I, I, I'm very disappointed that it's a great loss for us. But uh, when you get an invitation to speak to Chicago and Milwaukee in my profession, you've made the big time. <laughs> you folks are the, are the cream of the crop when it comes to roundtables around the nation. And we very much respect this group and everything you've accomplished, and it is quite an honor. And for me, the second time to come back, and if the Mayans are right and we're all toast a week from today, <laughs> I could not think of a better place to do my last presentation <laughs> uh, than to the Chicago Roundtable. What I want to talk to you about tonight is an area of Louisiana that does not receive a lot of attention, and we'll go into some detail about why. But on the train ride up here from Springfield, it reminded me of a trip through Louisiana by train one time. Uh, many of you know the Park Service has created a program of which I was part of uh, called Trails to Rails, where volunteers and Park Service personnel get on trains with Amtrak and go all over the country talking about the, the scenery and the, the history of what we're passing. Uh, the first inaugural trip of that venture, which is now all over the United States, was between Lafayette, Louisiana and New Orleans, Louisiana. And on one of those first trips, I remember going through the Atchafalaya Basin, and right in the middle of that great swamp, the engine broke down. And as we were driving up on the trip, riding up on the train yesterday, I remembered the conductor getting on the intercom and saying, basically, I got good news and I got bad news. He said, the bad news is the engineer, the engine is down, it's finished, we're going to be here for a while until a new engine reaches us. And he says, the good news is you're not in an airplane. <laughs> so, God bless what I'd like to talk to you about tonight, as Brian said, I spent 10 years of my career in Louisiana. Uh, my better half here is a native Louisiana from the Shreveport area, and she knows these areas every bit as well as I do. But the Red River Campaign was of particular interest to me because it's very much always been overshadowed by what's going on elsewhere in the nation. In this late winter and spring of 1864, and if you'll follow along with the maps that I handed out to you, those of you not familiar with the geography, as, you, as I mentioned these different places and these different battles, uh, the maps will help you a little bit to understand how this all works out geographically. If you look at the situation, as I said, late winter, early spring, 1864, Grant is about to assume overall command of all Union forces. Grant's basic strategy was to finally bring the full might of the entire federal military to bear on the Confederacy. Instead of attacking piecemeal, brings all the Union force together and crush Confederate resistance once and for all. Eventually, of course, later in that spring, he will begin the Overland Campaign in Virginia. Sherman will assemble his forces just south of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and begin his advance on Atlanta. The next largest group of Union soldiers in any one concentration, the Army of the Gulf, based out of New Orleans, they're not quite sure what they want the Army of the Gulf to do. There are several different options that were looked at. Should they go after Mobile, one of the last major ports still open to the Confederacy? Should they invade Texas by water through Galveston or Brownsville? Or should they try to reach Texas by what's called the Overland Route, either through the heart of Louisiana or through the Red River Valley? As you heard mentioned before, there was great disagreement among the Union High Command of what to do. In 1863, the Federals had begun, late 1863, the Federals had begun to feel out some of these approach routes. They had attempted to get a foothold on the Texas coast, and they are badly defeated and forced to withdraw after the Battle of Sabine Crossroads, which is near present-day Lake Charles, Louisiana, on September the 8th, 1863. A Union force tries to push through the overland route through the middle of Louisiana, out of Opelousas, Louisiana, which you see on the map. They try to go straight west from there. And on October the 3rd, 1863, they are badly beaten at the Battle of Bayou Bobeau. After that battle, the Union forces basically pull back south and begin to concentrate around the town of New Iberia, which you see on your map at the lower end of the, of the, of the Bayou Teche region. 
It is there that the Union forces will be centered at the beginning of 1864. Now why the Red River? President Lincoln and General Halleck favored going up the Red. As you heard earlier, Grant and Porter were very much opposed to the idea. Anybody know what their preference was? Mobile. Mobile. But they were overruled. Why do you think Lincoln and Halleck were more concerned about getting up the Red River Valley? You've already had the hardest of the different reasons mentioned in the trip. My congratulations on the trivia. You already you stole one of my, my best questions. <laughs> Most people don't remember that one. Why, why would Lincoln and Halleck want to send the Union Army up the Red River Valley? Well, you, you got the one in the trivia contest. The hardest one people don't realize is Maximilian has been put on the throne of Mexico. The French have seized Mexico in violation of the Monroe Doctrine. And Lincoln feels very strongly, as does Halleck, that a show of military force by the United States will be a support move for the Waristas and also a detriment to hopefully deter the French from continuing their conquest of Mexico. Um, there are, what are the other reasons? Anybody, we've already heard one mention. Make Texas a loyal state again. To bring more Texas and Louisiana into the Union with what eventual goal in 1864? Lincoln. The election of 1864. More votes for Lincoln. But you've already heard the other one mentioned too. It was in the trivia. Cotton. Why was there this great desire for cotton? It's, 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 the wars on the Red River are full of it. Why would there be this great need for this cotton? Get the mills up. The mills in New England, and where's Banks from? New England. The Bobbin Boy, his nickname, from having worked in the mills when he was a young man of New England. So she seizure of that cotton to reinforce those New England mills is extremely important. There's one other reason. What was in Tyler, Texas? Confederate manufacturing the supply depot. You better believe it. A major Confederate, only a prisoner of war camp, but a major manufacturing point of weaponry and ammunition for the Trans-Mississippi region, Tyler, Texas. And so the area around Marshall and Tyler was to be the eventual overall objective of the campaign. Destroy Richard Taylor's military force and to seize that supply depot. These are the reasons that the Red River Campaign comes into existence. The plan, as most plans go, is pretty well thought out. Sherman was to dispatch 10,000 men from Vicksburg, part of most of the 16th Corps, under the command of A.J. Smith. William Franklin, where do we remember William Franklin from? Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg, Mary's Heights. After, after that little fiasco, they ship him out west, and it seems like the Army of the Gulf seems to end up with everybody that screws up everybody where else, but that's another story. Uh, Franklin is in charge of the 13th and the 19th Corps, which is now, as I said earlier, centered in New Iberia. One of the forgotten components of the Red River Campaign was coming out of Arkansas. Frederick Steele and 10,000 more Union soldiers were to leave Little Rock, and all of these forces from Vicksburg, from New Iberia, from New Orleans, from Arkansas, were all to converge on the town of Shreveport, Louisiana, and from there begin their advance into Texas. This force of the United States Army was to be reinforced by David Dixon Porter and the United States Navy with a force of over 21 warships and a support fleet of over 100 vessels. So you can get an idea of how powerful this force is going to be. The campaign basically begins on March the 10th, 1864. Smith's men and Porter's fleet leave Vicksburg. On March the 12th, they reach the mouth of the Red River where it comes into the Mississippi, and they begin to move up the river. But not far from the mouth of the river, they run into the first Confederate fortification, a massive <coughs> earthwork referred to as Fort Derussi. The Union Navy begins to bombard Fort Derussi near Marksville almost immediately. But the idea of a land assault will not work from the front side. And so Smith lands his men at the town of Simsport on the Atchafalaya River and begins to march toward the backside of Fort Derussi at Marksville. Fort Derussi had vanished from history. 
And most of you are familiar with the American Battlefield Preservation Program, the survey we did almost 20 years ago. Well, I, I had the, the lucky responsibility of surveying most of the Louisiana sites for that initial study. And Fort DeRussi, we thought, was completely gone. The Red River had moved. We thought there were, that it was all overgrown. And for those of you that have been to Louisiana and been out in the swamps, and you know what the ground clutter is like down there. You spent some time, I'm sure, with Larry down there around Port Hudson. Um, it was just totally overgrown. As we began to hack into the spot where Fort DeRussi was, we suddenly found out the whole fort was still there. It today has been cleared and is now a state historic site. And it's worth seeing if you get the chance, if you're down that way. But basically what happens is, the Union fleet continues to bombard the fort, which contains a garrison of about 300 Confederate soldiers and amounts about 10 heavy pieces of artillery. At the same time, the fleet is keeping it pinned down. Smith's men have marched from Simsport to the back side of the fort, and at 6 o'clock in the evening, they storm the fort from the rear. It is a quick, sharp fight. The garrison is overwhelmed and almost entirely captured. The Union forces only lose 38 men killed and wounded. But at that point, the campaign begins to unravel a little bit. And I have several books up here to look at that are the best that have been written so far on the Red River Campaign. And Gary Joyner, my good friend from Shreveport, uh, wrote a book which I would have used as the title for this talk if he hadn't written and come up with the title for his book first, which is simply one damn blunder after another. Uh, and we're going to start talking about those blunders from here on in. But uh, he got the title first. Basically. And the first thing they try to do is destroy Fort DeRussi to make sure that the Confederates are never able to use it in their rear as they advance up the Red River. But right from the beginning, they begin to bungle the job. And I want to read to you what a Union soldier wrote about that attempted demolition. I knew what it was in an instant, for I could see shells bursting high in the air. The whole heaven seemed to be on fire. Pieces of timber and lumps of earth were falling in camp and beyond. Men were running for their lives to the woods. There was scarcely time to think before another magazine blew up, followed by a shower of fragments. Two men were killed and several wounded. But this gives you an early idea of how disorganized this campaign is going to be. The next morning, those Union soldiers get back on their transports and they continue on up the river. At the same time this is going on, Franklin's troops on March the 15th have left New Iberia. They begin a march to some of the most beautiful land in the United States, in fact, not in the world, in the United States of America. They advance along Bayou Tesh, shoot through the sugar plantations of the lower Delta area, past the town of Verdeganville, the present day town of Lafayette, on up to Opelousas, and eventually into the cotton fields of the Red River Valley. They eventually will rendezvous with the rest of A.J. Smith's men at the town of Alexandria on the Red River. Alexandria, when Franklin's men get there, have, has already been taken on March the 15th by the U.S. Navy and by A.J. Smith's men. Basically, the Confederates at this point are in no position to offer any resistance, and they are retreating before the massive Union onslaught. Basically, 180 sailors captured the city of Alexandria. But instead of fortifying their position, Porter looks around and decides they have a more important job to do. And what do you think Porter sends his sailors out to do? Cotton. Start collecting cotton. Colonel James G. Wilson of the Union Army would write after the war, I love these sailors in this very moment, the sailors would go into the country five or six miles, find a lot of cotton, and brand it CSA. And then underneath it, pretending it was government cotton, and underneath it they would then stencil USN. I recollect that I asked the Admiral, referring to Admiral Porter, one day, when he, had the, when he, had, when he did me the honor of asking me to dine with him, if he knew what those letters stood for. His answer was no. And I said, I, I said that they stood for Cotton Stealing Association of the United States Navy. <laughs> if this did lead, again, to a great deal of anxiety between the Army and the Navy. This is something we talked about at my table at dinner. The morale between the Army and the Navy begins to disintegrate almost immediately. 
<clears throat> General Banks himself would write the following of this moment at Alexandria. The officers of the Navy, during the time we were there at Alexandria, were, 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 were representing from day to day to the officers of the Army the amount of prize money they were to receive which excited a great deal of bad feeling on the part of the army. All the general officers urged me very earnestly to arrest these men, make war upon them, on the ground that they were engaged in a business that did not belong to the Navy at all. Obviously not a good command situation. This anxiety will only continue to grow as the campaign continues. General Banks himself would arrive in Alexandria on March the 24th. Franklin's infantry comes tromping into town on the 25th. Banks now has under his command a force of 36,000 infantry. Now remember, these are battle-hardened veterans, the 13th and 16th Corps from Vicksburg and the 19th Corps who had fought at Port Hudson and in the Bayou campaigns. They have 90 pieces of artillery, field artillery, and as I said before, they are supported by 21 heavy warships. Banks will now begin his move from Alexandria on up the Red River. He evacuates the town, basically leaves the town on the 26th, moving to the northwest. On that day, a very important letter arrives to General Banks from General Grant, basically saying he only has use of General Sherman's troops until late April. And so he expects this campaign to be concluded by that point, and Sherman's troops return to him to be utilized for the advance on Atlanta. And so Banks will begin moving with unusual speed for General Banks in order to meet this deadline. Banks will finally get out of town on April the 2nd following his troops, primarily because he bothered to have an election first <laughs> to home base, as you said, a pro-union government for the city of Alexandria, and one that he actually tried to pawn off as uh, the new government of Louisiana, but that didn't, uh, that didn't hold up very well. Now, as he's beginning the advance, as we said before, the Confederates up to this point really do not have the strength to fight back. They are commanded by Richard Taylor, who you also heard mentioned in the trivia question. Richard Taylor is hated by the Union forces. He is seen as the worst kind of traitor the son of a United States president, now fighting for the Confederacy. But in this case, he will prove to be one of the best Confederate commanders that the war probably produced. In this moment of trying to organize forces, the few men he has, at the greatest moment of strength around the whole area of the Red River, at the most, he might be able to put together 16,000 men if he'd ever been able to get them in from the same place at the same time maybe 60 pieces of artillery. Many of these men are ill-clothed, they are ill-fed, and they are ill-equipped. Remember that because it's going to play a very important role in what's about to take place, the fact that these men were so poorly equipped against the oncoming Federals. The other problem that Taylor is faced with right at the beginning is that just after Banks is pulling out of Alexandria on the 21st of March, the Confederate cavalry, the eyes and ears of Taylor's army, made the mistake of getting caught off guard, and Union cavalry sweeps in on them at Henderson's Hill and basically captures the entire Confederate contingent of cavalry that were Taylor's eyes and ears. And so for the first part of the campaign, Taylor is going to have little information about the oncoming Federals until reinforcement cavalry appears from Texas under the command of Tom Green. We'll talk more about them later. Basically, the situation is not good. Just to give you a little side story real quick of how much the Union soldiers hated Richard Taylor. Richard Taylor lived on a plantation just outside of New Orleans. When that plantation is captured by federal forces early in the war, in order to see to it that Richard Taylor never occupies that house, they slaughter the animals on the plantation, including the ponies that belong to his children, and they hang those carcasses inside that house. And there they hang for an extended period of time um, so that Richard Taylor could not return to it. Uh, eventually, uh, the house is obviously restored and it still stands today. It is still a private home uh, along the River Road. So it is still there. But this is an idea of the animosity that existed toward Richard Taylor at this time uh, during the war. Like I said, they saw him as, as the worst kind of traitor. 
basically the problems of the Confederate command structure that were also mentioned in the in the trivia contest now really begin to show. Who was who was who did Taylor report to? Kirby Smith, the commander of the Trans Mississippi. Kirby Smith and Richard Taylor hated each other. I mean, literally hated each other. Smith sends orders down to Taylor that he is not to engage the Federals. He is to actually bring his troops to Arkansas and help Smith beat Steele, send him reeling back to Little Rock, then maybe they might deal with Banks. Richard Taylor, a Louisianan, with mostly Louisianans under his command, will have none of this. He makes the decision himself, which eventually will be looked at as insubordination, that he is going to stand and fight. His Louisianans want to fight with him. And so he makes the decision that the Federals will never retreat for it, at least not over there, at least it would have to be over their dead bodies. And that's the situation we're going to be faced with. You have a complete breakdown in the Confederate command structure, and Taylor is basically going to operate on his own. By April the 1st, the Union forces have reached and occupied the beautiful little town of Natchitoches on the Cane River and the, up, uh, the, uh, the Red River. Basically, Banks now makes the critical decision of the whole campaign. When he arrives at Natchitoches, up to this point, he has basically been following the river road, which parallels right along the Red River. That way, his troops can remain under the protection of the United States Navy. For reasons that we still debate today, he makes the decision to leave the river road with the bulk of his army, move 20 miles to the west, into the Pine Barrens, as I call them, into the Piney Hills, away from the protection of the United States Navy, and advance on Shreveport, instead of continuing to go up the river road. Why did he do this? We don't know to this day. The two accepted theories are one, Banks was so overconfident at this point he honestly believed that the Confederates would make no attempt to stand and fight before he reached Shreveport. The other story that has recently surfaced is that the guys that were supposedly Union loyalists were planted by the Confederates. And they deliberately got Banks to take his army away from the river and into the Piney Woods for the reasons that I am about to explain to you. Which story is accurate? Take your pick. The results are, still, are, are obviously going to be the same. Banks puts, does put 2,500 of his men on the transports, and they do try to continue to go up the river. But the rest of those 36,000 men move inland. The entire force is again on the move by April the 6th. Let me read to you how a Union soldier described the land that they now moved into. This is a quote from a Union cavalryman. He called it a howling wilderness, a narrow road, parts of which were merely a sunken woods path, resembling a ditch, a deep, broad ditch, wound over hills of red clay and sand. Pine thickets pressed in from either side of the road like the walls of a corridor. The few buildings that we passed on the way were crude affairs of clay and pine poles. Water was almost non-existent, except which fell from the sky on April the 7th and turned the road into a rusty mud. A beginning of a nightmare. Not only that, but listen to the way, this is a one-lane little road through the woods. Listen to the way Banks aligned his army. The Union cavalry is out in front. Behind the cavalry comes 150 supply wagons on this single road. Behind that is Franklin's infantry. Behind Franklin are 700 more wagons before you get the Smith's infantry. Basically, the column was 20 miles long on this one-lane road through the Pine Barrens. Do we have any military geniuses in the group? Do you see disaster coming? Yeah. Banks did not. It's a recipe for disaster. On the morning of April the 7th, the Union cavalry outside of the town of Pleasant Hill begins to meet stiffer resistance. 
General Tom Green and his Texas cavalrymen have appeared on the battlefield, and they are now beginning to fight a much more vicious delaying action. The Union Cavalry Commander, a general also by the name of Lee, no relationship to the Virginia Lees, immediately sends word back that Confederate resistance in front of him is stiffening. Please send me help. General Franklin doesn't believe him. But Franklin basically tells him, take a hike. I, you know, I'm not moving the wagons. I'm just going to, you know, there's nothing going on there. Lee pleads for help on the 7th. It never comes. They continue to push. They push Green back to a field just outside, just south of the town of Mansfield, Louisiana. There, Taylor has assembled every soldier he can get his hands on. He eventually will have a force of about 9,000 men and about 60 pieces of artillery. Colonel T.R. Bonner of the 18th Texas Infantry would describe the feelings of his men as they marched through the town of Mansfield to take their position just south of Mansfield to meet the oncoming Union forces. As we passed through the streets of the beautiful town, they were thronged with the fair ladies, misses and matrons, who threw bright garland at our feet and bade us in God's name drive back the Yankees and save their cherished homes. As their cheerful voices and cheerful songs of the sunny south fell in accents of the sweetest melody upon our ears, we felt that we were thrice armed and though greatly outnumbered, would drive back the foe. On the morning of April the 8th, 1864, Union Cavalry General Lee enters the south edge of that large field. Talk about getting a shiver up and down your spine. He looks out across that field, and what does he see but 8,000 plus Confederate soldiers in line of battle. Once again, he immediately sends word back, uh, General Franklin, excuse me, you know that Confederate army you're not supposed to fight? <laughs> it's sitting out here in front of me. Franklin still doesn't believe him. It is not until early in the afternoon when General Banks finally gets to the head of the column and he basically says, yeah, General Lee, I think you're right. And he finally orders Franklin to get his carcass in gear and get infantry up to help the cavalry. But I'm afraid by that point, it's going to be too late because of the confinement of that single road. He orders Landrum's division of the 13th Corps, veterans of Vicksburg, 4,800 4, strong, 4,800 strong, to move forward and take position on the south side of that field. The Battle of Mansfield, or the Battle of Sabine Crossroads, as the Federals called it, is about to begin. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Taylor is finally ready to make his move. The attack begins with the assault of the Louisianans under General Mouton. His division moves forward with the immense force that they've all this bottled up energy that these Louisianans have felt as they have pulled back and back from the Federal forces is unleashed. They storm their way across the open field, and if you look at the map of the battlefield of Mansfield, you'll see the Federals are in absolutely horrible position. They are basically in an L-shaped formation with their line at an angle. And you will notice very quickly that the huge number of Confederates, you've got basically 4,800 against 8,800, you can see very plainly that once the entire Confederate force goes into action after Mouton, they are easily going to overlap both ends of the Union line, which is going to be the recipe for disaster. Basically, Mouton's first attack is repulsed. In fact, during that first charge, Mouton is actually killed. And leading his men forward, the story goes that one of his own men would write, a bunch of Federals, as they overwhelm part of the Union line, try to surrender. As General Mouton rides up and allows them to be taken prisoner, a couple of the Federals picked up their weapons, and General Mouton was shot at close range, five bullets going right through the middle of his body very closely. Basically, these men just picked up their guns and easily dropped the offending Yankees very quickly. General Mouton is a unique story all to himself. He is of Acadian, he's French, he speaks French. He is of Acadian or Cajun ancestry. His father had been the first Cajun or Acadian governor of the state of Louisiana. 
He's a very dynamic individual, a very important individual, and probably one of the best subordinate commanders that Richard Taylor had in his army, and he is going to be a huge loss. One of the most interesting things, when I did my last tour of the Red River Valley took place at this very section of the battlefield, as I was standing right there where that L is in our last tour group, these are the kind of things that make my business a lot of fun. As I'm talking about Mouton's division attack, I'm talking about the line getting overwhelmed and beginning to crumble, I had a person in my group speak up and he asked me, where was the 19th Kentucky? So I pointed out, as you see on your map, if you look at the top of the L, you can see I think they're the second or third regiment down the line, if I remember correctly, without the map in front of me. And I said, because the gentleman then goes and tells me, well, I had an ancestor that was captured here who was in the 19th Kentucky. And as this gentleman is explaining this, a young lady from Texas now kind of speaks up and goes, well, I had a relative in the Crescent Regiment who was in this battle. And if you look across the field from the 19th Kentucky, who do you see? The Crescent Regiment. And here at this moment, this was a few years ago, here at this moment, you have these two descendants of these two individuals meeting at that critical spot. That is why we study this great conflict in such detail, because of moments like that and the memory it holds for all our families. And they actually got along with each other. So <laughs> they're both still speaking to us anyway. But these are the kind of stories that still are with us to this day. As we said earlier, the Union line is easily overwhelmed. Both flanks collapse, and the Union line just crumbles, and the Confederates start pushing them back. Now here's where the, the, this organization, the Union force, comes into play. More Union infantry is coming forward but they don't arrive in time before that line collapses. If you look right behind the first line, you'll see the beginning of a second line, which was thrown up just as the first line is collapsing. And that is Cameron's division, also of the 13th Corps, only about 1,300 strong, but they were supposed to come up and extend Landrum's line, but they never get there. They basically also are very quickly overwhelmed and routed and driven back. Now the Confederates begin sweeping down that road. What do you think is the next thing they run into? Lots and lots of wagons. Let me describe to you what a Union soldier wrote about this moment in the battle. Still thicker and denser came the frightened crowd, rushing past in every possible manner. Men without hats and coats, men without guns and accoutrements, cavalrymen without horses, artillerymen without cannon, Wounded men bleeding and crying at every step, men begrimed with smoke and powder, all in a state of fear and frenzy. While they shouted to our boys not to go any for, not to go forward any further, for they would be slaughtered. The road was also almost blocked up with the wagons, caissons, mules, runaway horses, while Negro teamsters and cavalrymen were drive, were driving directly through the ranks. It is total confusion. But now, in one of those little critical moments of a battle, when the army of the Gulf should have been destroyed that day, there's a delay in the Confederate attack. Remember what I said earlier about the condition of those Confederate troops? What do you think they stop and do? They start pillaging those wagons. It will take almost two hours for Taylor and his officers to get the Confederate units back into line of battle and continue to pursue the retreating Federals. That two hours is going to be decisive. For in those two hours, if you look at the second map of the Battle of Mansfield, you will see two miles to the rear, the assembling of, the, of Emory's division of the 19th Corps, 5,300 strong. And as darkness is coming on about 6 p.m., the Confederates run smack into Emory's division at Chapman's Bayou. They will assault, they will charge several times, but Emory's men will hold their position and allow the remains of the Union Army to leave the battlefield. The Confederate attack stops. Union losses, about 12,000 men engaged, 700 killed and wounded, 1,500 prisoners, 20 pieces of artillery, and over 200 wagons 
will be taken by the Confederates. Out of their almost 9,000 engaged, they will lose about 1,000 men killed and wounded, all total. A third of them in Mouton's division alone from the initial frontal assault. By the morning of the 9th, the next day, Emory has left his position at Chapman's Bayou, and he has fallen back about 12 miles to what was the town of Pleasant Hill. Taylor will reorganize his army, and he will slowly begin to follow. Banks at Pleasant Hill has assembled his entire force. And now will come the largest battle of the Red River Campaign, the Battle of Pleasant Hill. If you look at the map of the Battle of Pleasant Hill, you'll see the Yankees still hadn't learned their lesson. If you look at their alignment, for those of you that know that terrain, it is hilly, it is rugged, very steep ravines, a lot of undergrowth, a few open fields, and the worst thing banks could do, which says units up, disconnected. If you look at the way they're positioned, you see Shaw's Brigade on the road, totally out in front, totally isolated. You see Benedict's Brigade off to the left of the swamp, totally disconnected from the Union line. And if you look at the rear, you see Dwight's and McMillan's divisions, uh, basically up on the northern edge of the map, at the northern edge of the town. And at the bottom, you see the rest of A.J. Smith's men. What you don't see on there is A.J. Smith's men are all hidden behind a ridge. And that's going to play a critical role in what's about to happen. Taylor gets his army up, and by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he once again charges full strength into the Union position. He has received Union, he has received reinforcements, and he once again, just like at Sabine Crossroads at Mansfield, the Union position crumbles almost immediately. Shaw's brigade, led by the 32nd Iowa, is almost completely, well actually it is completely surrounded. They basically form a sort of Napoleonic square, and they begin fighting off Confederates in all different directions. Benedict's brigade to the south, Colonel Benedict is killed almost quick, as soon as the battle begins, and his brigade is completely destroyed and pushed back. The Confederates, basically Churchill and Walker's troops from the states of Texas, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, basically sweep into the town of Pleasant Hill, pushing the Federals back before them. It looks like another Mansfield all over again. But now luck is going to come into play. The Confederate attack, basically the fight is a fight house to house, hand to hand, street to street. Now, how many of you, how many of you have ever been to Pleasant Hill? Anyone? Okay, well, I need to explain this then. If you go there in the near future, you're going to see a whole lot of empty farm fields where there was once a town. But if you look at those farm fields, you can still see the remains of the streets. What happened to the town of Pleasant Hill? Because there's still a town of Pleasant Hill. It's two miles away. What happened after the war is the railroad came through. And instead of the town dying when the railroad didn't come through Pleasant Hill, they kind of picked up Pleasant Hill and moved it two miles. And so a lot of the buildings that were there at the time of the battle are now in the town of Pleasant Hill, two miles away at the railhead. So what you see is open field. So we still, that battlefield, it's, only, it's in private hands right now, by the way, too. It's in private ownership, so it's still there. But if you go looking for the town of Pleasant Hill today, and you start looking for the battlefield, you're two miles away. I'll save that story for another time. Basically, the Confederates looks like it's going to be another route. It looks like they got the Yankees totally on the run again. But now, as they're sweeping through the town, if you look at the map, the Confederates are pushing through the town, and then behind that ridge are A.J. Smith's men. As the Confederate right flank goes past that ridge, all of a sudden, all those veterans of the 16th Corps come sweeping over that ridge right smack into the Confederate right, they route it, and they begin pushing the whole Confederate force back. Dwight and McMillan's men attack from the north, and they slowly push the Confederates. Eventually, they will push them back over two miles, rescuing Shaw's brigade, which has been fighting surrounded for several hours. Eventually, they will push the Confederates back and eventually recover a great deal of the material that they left behind at Sabine Crossroads. With that counterattack in Dwight's brigade, is a soldier by the name of Lyons Wakeman in the 153rd New York. 
I wanted to read to you what Wakeman wrote about this moment in this battle and this campaign. Our army made an advance up the river to Pleasant Hill, about 40 miles. There we had a fight. The first day of the fight, our army got whipped, and we had to retreat back about 10 miles. The next day, the fight was renewed, and the firing took place at about, began about 8 o'clock in the morning, and there was a heavy Confederate cannonade all during the day and sharp firing of infantry. I was not in the first day's fight, but the next day I had to face the enemy bullets with my regiment. I was under fire for about four hours and laid on the field of battle all night. There were three dead in my company, or three wounded in my company, and one dead. Remember the name of Private Waveman. The soldier's going to have a lot to do with the conclusion of my program. Basically, it is now a federal victory. But what does Banks do with this victory? He debates continuing to pursue the Confederate forces. But then he gets a note from Admiral Porter. As Admiral Porter has gone up the Red River towards Shreveport, he finds that the Confederates have sunk a steamer lengthwise across the river. The legend is that an invitation for the Federals to attend a prisoner of war ball in Shreveport that evening was attached to the, the hulk of that uh, steamer. Whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. But basically, Banks, or excuse me, Porter cannot get by it. He has, does not have the equipment to destroy it. The Red River is very narrow. He can't ram his way through. And so he sends a note back to Banks saying, basically, I can't go any further. If your infantry isn't coming, there's nothing I can do to help you. With that piece of information, with water running low, with morale basically down the dumper, Banks makes the decision to retreat. 12,000 plus Union soldiers have fought that day at Pleasant Hill. 1,200 of them are killed and wounded. The Confederates also had about 12,000 engaged, and they will lose about 1,400 killed and wounded. Basically, Banks and Porter decide to concentrate at Grandin Corps, Grandin Corps on the Red River near the town of Natchitoches. As the retreat begins, one of the most interesting fights of the entire Civil War is about to take place. Taylor receives orders from Kirby Smith, basically siphoning off most of his infantry to go fight Steele in Arkansas. What he does, what Taylor decides to do, is he's going to take what many has left, keep the pressure on Banks' retreating infantry, and he sends Tom Green's Texas cavalrymen off to follow the United States Navy back down the river. Now remember, these warships, how many of you have been on the Upper Red? Anybody? It's not a very wide river. These warships cannot turn around. they got to back out of there. So they're not moving real fast through a very narrow channel. And so the Texas Cavalry is sent out to see what damage they can do. In order in doing this, basically, the, probably on April the 12th, 1864, the strangest battle of the Civil War takes place. Two of the Union ironclads ground in the shallow Red River. They're stuck. And between that shallow ground and the shore is very shallow water. So Tom Green comes up with the brilliant idea to dismount his cavalrymen and with the assistance of four field pieces of artillery to charge those ironclads. Yeah. Bad idea. Very quickly in the battle, one of the cannonballs from those ironclads takes off Tom Green's head. But uh, bless their hearts, those Texans still charge those ironclads over and over and over again, and they are cut to ribbons. Eventually, they will be refloated, and they will continue their retreat down the river. Uh, but the Battle of Blair's Landing had to be one of the strangest sights you could possibly imagine of these dismounted cavalrymen attacking these ironclads. Basically, they will, the entire Union force by April the 15th will be back at Grand Corps near Natchitoches. Banks still doesn't know exactly what he's going to do, but now circumstances are going to answer the question for him. The Red River is dropping rapidly. The warships can no longer function. They need to get out of the Red River. And so Banks makes the decision to continue his retreat. The entire federal force begins to fall back to Alexandria. Basically now, Taylor has about 5,000 soldiers left, chasing 25,000 federal soldiers. Doesn't sound much very practical, does it? But Banks is so panicked by this point, he just continues to retreat. 
Taylor with what men he does have left. On April the 23rd, he tries to cut off the retreat at a place called Manette's Ferry, where the Cane River enters into the Red River. On the heights on the south side of the river, uh, the Confederates dig in, but the Federals are so massive in number, all they do is find a ford up river, basically get on the Confederate flank, and they easily, easily push the small Confederate force aside and continue their retreat. A soldier in the 114th New York would describe this retreat and this moment. Destruction and desolation followed on the trail of the retreating column. At night, the burning buildings mark our pathway. As far as the eye can reach, we see in front new fires breaking out, and in the rear, the dying embers tell the tale of war. Hardly a building is left unharmed. The wanton and useless destruction of property has well earned A.J. Smith's command a lasting disgrace. In order that the stigma of rendering homeless and houseless innocent women and children may not rest upon us, be it recorded that not only the commander of the army, but our division and brigade commanders have issued orders prohibiting it and threatening offenders with instant death. So again, you see the rivalry even within the army between the eastern soldiers and the western soldiers. By April the 27th, the army is back in Alexandria. But now there's another problem. The water has dropped so low that there is only three feet of water over the rapids, the limestone outcroppings that are at Alexandria. Seven feet of water is needed to get Porter's warships back over those rapids. Ten warships, two million dollars worth of Navy hardware are trapped. Porter begins to get very nervous that banks in the Army are going to say, bye, we're leaving, have a nice life. And you know, obviously Porter would not have uh, uh, done well after that. Enter into the picture the gentleman who's named in your trivia contest. From Wisconsin, lumber man, real estate man, engineer, Joseph Bailey. He is chief engineer on General Franklin's staff. And he comes to the banks and he said, Porter, and he says, basically, I'll build you a sloop that they use in the timber industry. I'll build you a dam, make you a sloop. Consider it the world's first water ride. <laughs> and they kind of look at him, water slide, I guess I should say. And they kind of look at him and go, you're nuts, get out of here. But then as the situation gets more and more desperate, they realize they need Bailey's help. On May the 2nd, work begins on the famous dam. If you look at the last map in the, in the grouping, the back side, you'll see the way the dam was put together. Eventually, over 3,000 men, 200 wagons, and 1,000 horses and mules will go to work on this dam. The lower part of the dam will be 758 feet long and will have to hold back a 10 mile an hour current. Basically, the soldiers of the Army of the Gulf, in order to the one side of the dam from the south is basically made of cribbage, which are timbers fastened together, and in that cribbage would go stoves, uh, bricks, anything they could get their hands on to weigh it down. On the north side of the Pineville side of the river, they cut down trees and made what's called the reverse tree dam. You basically place the branches, the trunks downstream, the branches upstream so they don't catch all the debris coming down the river and basically reinforce itself. Basically, two huge wings begin coming out from each side. To give you an idea of how unique this feat is, you have, for one of the first times, white soldiers from Wisconsin, from Maine, and African-American soldiers from the Corps d'Afrique working together in this water. In fact, several of them will drown making this dam. But in this unique moment, you have black and white soldiers in the water together building this massive structure. By May the 6th, there is four feet of water behind the dam. By May the 8th, five and a half feet. That afternoon, they begin to close it. Some of the smaller vessels can get, even get into the lower pool. But by May the 9th, Banks starts looking at Porter's ships and goes, wait a minute, why are they still the same as they were when you got here? They're still sitting in the water at the same level. Aren't you getting some things off of there? What, why are they still so heavy? 
What do you think that reason was? The holes are still full. The holes are still full of cotton. And Ben, yeah, Banks finally says, "Port, get that out of there, and get the cannons off, get the armament off. Come on, guy, help me here." And so Porter finally gets on board and uh, gets his act together. But early that morning on the ninth, disaster struck. The barges that were hauled into place to seal the last part of the dam basically break through. It collapses. And about a 100-foot gap is torn in the middle of the dam. The current is so strong at this point, Bailey decides not to try to plug it. But if you look at your map and look upstream, you will see two more wings that Bailey will now build to basically create about a half mile of, as I said before, the world's first water slide. So you basically got those two sets of wings coming out, forcing all that water down this one slide. It'll work perfectly. The Lexington is the first warship to go through, and if you can imagine it, this 70-foot gap, which it eventually is in the two wings, you can imagine these heavy warships literally rocking up and down as they go over the rapids and down this water slide. By May the 12th, there was enough water in the sluice to make it work, and at 6 a.m. on the 12th, the run begins, and by the morning of the 13th, the entire Union fleet is below the rapids and is saved. As the army leaves the next morning, they leave Alexandria in flames. There are very few pre-Civil War structures left in Alexandria because the Federals basically burned the place to the ground. The Federals are headed now toward the Simsport and across the Atchafalaya and the safety of the Mississippi River. On May the 16th, Taylor will make his last attempt to stop the Union retreat at the town of Mansoura, on the Opelousas Plain, he will put into line of battle 5,000 soldiers and 32 pieces of artillery. As his men are sitting there in this beautiful open plain, where you can see as far as you can see, out comes 25,000 Union soldiers. Bill Banks then puts into line of battle, and Taylor, bless his heart, he looks at his men, got 5,000, here come 25,000, and they're ticked off to begin with. And Taylor is smart enough to say, bad idea. They exchange a couple of artillery shots, and Taylor gets out of the way and lets the retreat continue. <clears throat> they get to the Atchafalaya, and then Banks realizes he's got another problem. He forgot to bring something along. What do you think he forgot? A bridge. But pontoons, yes. There's no bridge. They got Confederates to their rear. They got a 700-foot river in front of them, and no bridge. Once again, enter James, uh, uh, Joseph Bailey. Bailey comes up with the idea of taking steamboats, lashing them together up and downstream, and running planks across the steamboats. And by using that bridge, it will allow the army to escape. And of course, once they're across, the bridge is dismantled, and the Union Army is safe. The Red River Campaign is over. It has been 69 days long. There will be one Red Rear Guard action at Yellow Bayou. Uh, that by this time, though, the Union Army is safe, and, and it really doesn't amount to anything but a last bloody skirmish. The campaign is over. Union losses will be over 8,000 men, 60 pieces of artillery, one ironclad, as you heard mentioned earlier, and two tinclads and five transports. The Confederates will lose almost 7,000 men and three vessels of their own. It is a campaign of waste. It probably shows more than any other campaign of the Civil War of how, if not handled properly, how easily disaster can befall an army. And as a conclusion, I would like to tell you what happens to some of those individuals that we've just talked about. Banks basically is finished as a commander. He's basically put on, actually replaced by Hurlbut, uh, but then eventually General Canby takes over the Army of the Gulf, and Banks kind of just fades away, never to be heard from again on a battlefield. And he still be, remains a political force, but not as a military commander. Anybody know what happens to Taylor? After the end, after he's charged with insubordination, and he's cleared, gets promoted, <laughs> which was a good thing, uh, but by that point the war is pretty much over, 
And one of the, the one of the more unique scenes of the Civil War is he's giving command of all the Confederate troops in Mississippi, eastern Mississippi, Alabama, western Georgia. But as he gets to the Mississippi River to cross to take his new command, what problem does he run into? You know, all sorts of Yankee warships. So they have he and two of his buddies get in a rowboat. <laughs> and they row across the Mississippi River right under the guns of the Federals to get to his new command. Taylor will do the best he can, but eventually he becomes the general who surrenders the last Confederate forces east of the Mississippi in May of 1865. The war does not end at Appomattox, which is always one of my big arguments. There's still Confederate forces in the field. Joseph Bailey, promoted to the rank of general, fights in the Mobile campaign, but then leaves the army, resigns, and he becomes the sheriff of Vernon County, Missouri. And in 1867, he will be shot in the back by an escaping prisoner. So he meets a, a very untimely fate. But the best example overall of the waste of the Red River Campaign is what happens to Private Wakeman of the 153rd New York. This soldier survived the retreat to Alexandria. This soldier then comes down with severe diarrhea on May the 3rd. This soldier survives the very difficult transportation route to New Orleans to the hospitals between May the 7th and May the 22nd. When he arrives, in New Orleans, he is in such bad shape, he is placed aside until he dies on June 19, 1864. And he is laid to rest with thousands of his comrades in the Chalmette National Cemetery. But that is not the end of this soldier's story. In the 1990s, after I was finished at Chalmette, I had just gone out to Lafayette, the young lady that replaced me called me on the phone one afternoon frantically I mean, she was just terribly upset. She goes, I have a problem. I have some folks in my office, and they come to see their ancestor who's buried here in Chalmette, and the name on the headstone is wrong. They want to get it changed. How do I do it? I said, no problem. You send a note off. There's a form. You send it to the VA. They'll make a new stone, and that's all there is to it. And she's getting more and more frantic. And I go, well, what is the problem? I mean, she says, well, the soldier's name is Ryan Wakeman. I said, well, what's the problem? His name is Sarah. One of the few confirmed cases of a woman who fought and died alongside her male brethren in the Union Army. Sarah's a neat story. The oldest of 11 children who early in her life, in order to support her poor family, had gone to work on the canals of western New York disguised as a man. When all her buddies joined the Army, she did too. She's even credited with, by, by her company commander for beating up the company bully. <laughs> but what's neat about the story is that she wrote letters home, had a photograph of herself taken, sent all sorts of presents home to her brothers and sisters, and the family, because they felt disgraced by this individual, hid them all the way in the attic. And then in the 1990s, they were discovered. And there was so much solid information about her that this book has been written about her, and to their credit, the family chose not to change the headstone. And so if you go to Chalmette National Cemetery today, Sarah Wakeman still rests under her alias of Lyons Wakeman. You could not find a more fitting example of the waste and the conditions of the Red River Campaign and of a Civil War soldier. Even in death, her identity was not discovered. Well, I hope I got you all curious enough about this campaign. And it's a beautiful area to visit. And most of these sites that I've talked to you about are still there. I urge you to take the time to visit this area. Forget Virginia. Forget Georgia. <laughs> Come to Louisiana. I get a, I get, I'm on a payroll of the Anyway, again, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Questions? Questions? Yes, sir. It's been my pleasure to be a member of this organization probably longer than any other <laughs> one here. And it was also my pleasure to hear your talk. It was well researched, put together, and delivered. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You're more than welcome. It's a pleasure to be honored by being asked to come back again to Chicago.
Dale, I've got yeah. a question about the status of preservation there. I know there are quarrying operations that people were all bent out of shape about. Is, am, I, am I correct in that? The mining operations? The mining operations. The, yeah. Yes, what, the question what, was about the mining what, operations. What the status of preservation yeah. there? Yeah. Um, the battlefield at Mansfield, the third line, Emery's line at Chapman's Bayou, it is still under threat. Uh, it's private, private hands, and it is still under the threat of possibly being mined eventually. So that just kind of continues. On it's just an ongoing story. And then yeah. resolved. Yeah, as far and as the I know, the quiz did say he lost his ship. Yeah, yeah, I did. I do. I, my knowledge, it is still unresolved. I think you were thinking of Vicksburg. Where are they mining? What are they mining? What is the problem? What is the coal? Coal. Mm -hmm. I have to defer to my Louisiana for that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Dale, uh, Gary Joyner came up with the idea that the Red River was falling because that ship was placed and acted by accident as a dam yes. to divert the water. Is that generally accepted as far as you know in the Civil War historians community? Not only the ship as a dam to divert water, but also that the levee was blown above the ship to siphon water off into the side by Is there any conclusive evidence? No. Is it practical and possible? Absolutely to make the river drop faster than it would normally in the spring. Does it make sense militarily? Absolutely. So it very well could be correct. I have never come across a primary source which actually is an order or something that specifically says do this, but it certainly is to make sense. So I would agree with Gary that Gary is correct in that conclusion. I certainly would have done it, knowing that fleet was coming up. So uh, I would say yes, that it, it does make military, so militarily it makes sense. And like I said, I've got several books up here that I urge you, starting with Gary Joyner's is probably the best about the Red River campaign, if you want to learn some more about it. Dale, I want to ask a question, too, if you could uh, tell everybody the connection of John Wayne with the Red River campaign. <laughs> <laughs> All right, real quickly. One of my great honors of my career was to help with the establishment of what is now Cane River Creole National Historic Site. Uh, which is basically the Cave River Valley that we've talked about a lot this evening. The park consists of two plantation, uh, plantation units, which contain most of their historic outbuildings. It really interprets the outbuildings, not the big house as much as the, uh, the, all the other structures that made a working sugar or cotton plantation uh, viable. One of those is Oakland Plantation. And when we first looked at Oakland, the family that was donating it to us, of course, we were doing archaeology around the grounds. And as you're standing on the porch of the house, off to the left in the field, they began to find, they were doing around some of the outbuildings, they began to find all sorts of Union cavalry buttons, harnesses, buckles, bits, all sorts of stuff that should not have been there. There was no record of any Union cavalry unit, or Confederate cavalry for that matter, ever coming through there. And the archaeologists, bless their hearts, just were totally stumped. Well, then I got looking. Everybody remember the movie The Horse Soldiers? <laughs> remember the scene when they're approaching the female heroine's plantation? They're coming down the river road. They're dry, coming up the driveway, and then they're exiting camera stage left. Well, folks, that's where they were going. That was the staging area for all the cavalry. They're making a loop, basically. You've got about 100 cavalrymen making a big circle over and over again as John Wayne meets. I forget the female lead's name, but as John Wayne makes and meets that female character, um, yeah, that's Constance Powers is the actress. Um, that's what, that Hunter. was the staging yeah. area where the yeah. set was for all the cavalry. Miss Hannah and, Hunter. And they, yeah, Miss Hannah Hunter, thank you. <laughs> 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 and, they were, and, that, and they were still using a lot of original equipment. Back then, nobody really, there was so much of it still out there, they were still using original equipment. And that was the that was the answer that, that Oakland Plantation, the plantation that's used as Hannah Hunter's plantation, is now the property of the National Park Service. It's Oakland Plantation. It's the park headquarters, and it is there for you to visit. Uh, which I'm hoping I will get the pleasure of maybe taking you yeah. to a few years down the road. Uh, and uh, when, uh, just as a one little tie into that, at Magnolia Plantation, which is just downriver, I saw one of the most interesting things I have ever seen. Inside the barn at Magnolia is the only still fully functional, original, pre-Civil War cotton press, horse and mule powered cotton press, for which they made the cotton bales uh, by, by, by squeezing them together before they would be shipped. 
Uh, we had no idea it was there. And it is also available to see now. You know, I don't know no other one that exists in the country. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.